the skin is the largest organ of the body in square feet. Skin problems are common. Skin problems can interfere with the medical or surgical treatment of other conditions. Typical problems in affecting the skin integrity in the adult med surge patients include wounds, infections, and burn injuries. Age-related changes. As skin ages, it becomes thinner and more easily damaged. Intensifying this effect is the decreasing ability of the skin to heal itself and the increased likelihood for infection. Skin also receives less blood flow and lower gland activity. Elderly patients will take longer to heal from wounds, injuries, and infection, and are more likely to suffer comorbidities such as heart or renal failure. Progressive flattening of cells at the dermal and epidermal junction predisposes older people to skin tears from mechanical shearing forces, such as removal of tape, and friction from tightly applied restraints. In addition, skin moisture and irritation from incontinence and friction over bony prominences can lead to partial thickness skin destruction and early pressure ulcer formation. Wounds can vary from an aseptic surgical insection to a grossly infected draining presser ulcer with deep tissue destruction. Wounds heal through several stages. In the inflammatory phase, bacteria and debris are phagocytized and removed, and factors are released that cause the migration and division of cells that go to the injured area and start to rebuild. The proliferative phase is characterized by angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels, collagen deposition, granulation tissue formation, epithelialization, and wound contraction. In the maturation and remodeling phase, collagen is remodeled and realigned along tension lines, and cells that are no longer needed are removed by apoptosis. The body recognizes this tissue as foreign and gets rid of it. Primary intention healing. A wound without tissue loss, such as a clean laceration or a surgical inc incision, can be closed with sutures or staples. The wound edges are brought together and the skin layers lined up in correct anatomic position, that is, they are approximated, and held in place until healing is complete. Inflammation resolves quickly and the connective tissue repair is minimal, resulting in only in a thin scar. Secondary intention, deeper tissue injuries or wounds with tissue loss, such as chronic pressure ulcers or venous stasis ulcers, result in a cavity-like defect that requires gradual filling in of the dead space with connective tissue. Intervention is required for wounds that heal by secondary intention. Tertiary intention, wounds with a high risk Wounds with a high risk for infection, such as surgical incisions that enter a non-sterile body cavity or traumatic wounds that occur under unclean conditions, may be intentionally left open for several days. After debris, such as dead cell and tissues, and exudate have been removed or debrided, and inflammation is subsided, the wound is closed and with the plan of first intention healing. Factors that impair wound healing, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, vasculitis, thrombosis, venous, insu venous insufficiency, lymphedema, pharmacological vasoconstriction, irradiated tissue, leukemia, prolonged administration of high-dose anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids and aspirin, wound infection, foreign bodies, necrotic tissue, Repeated injury or irritation. Movement of a wound across a, such as across a joint. Wound des desiccation or maceration. Prolonged inflammatory response, which can result in low tissue oxygen tension and further tissue destruction. Aging. Chronic stress. Nutritional deficiencies, such as calories, protein, vitamins, minerals, and water. 
impaired oxygenation, pulmonary insufficiency, heart failure, hypovolemia, cirrhosis, uremia, prolonged hypothermia, coagulation disorders, and cytotoxic drugs. <clears throat> In a healthy patient, healing of a partial thickness wound by re-epithelialization takes about five to seven days. This process occurs most rapidly in tissue that is hydrated and oxygenated and has few organisms present. A pressure ulcer is tissue damage caused when skin and underlying soft tissue are compressed between a bony prominence and an external surface for an extended period. Although they commonly occur over the sacrum, hips, and ankles, Pressure ulcers can occur on any body surface. For example, nasal cannula tubing that is too tight can cause pressure ulcers behind the ears or in the nares. Tissue compression from pressure restricts blood flow to the skin, resulting in reduced tissue perfusion and oxygenation and leading to cell death. Ulcers occur most often in people with limited mobility because they cannot change their position to relieve their pressure. Stage 1 ulcers, the skin is intact. The area, usually covered over a bony prominence, is red but does not blanch with external pressure. The ulcer appears as a defined area of persistent redness in a lightly pigmented skin, whereas in darker skin tones the ulcer may appear as a persistent red, persistent red blue, or with purple hues. A stage 2 ulcer, the skin is not intact. There is partial thickness skin loss of the epidermis or dermis. The ulcer is superficial and may be characterized as an abrasion, a blister, such as open or fluid filled, or a shallow crater. Stage 3 ulcer, skin loss is full thickness. Subcutaneous tissue may be damaged or necrotic. Damage extends down to, but not through, the underlying fascia, bone, tendon, or muscle. And they are not, muscles is not exposed. Stage four, skin loss is again full thickness with exposed muscle, tendon, or bone. And often includes undermining and tunneling. Slough and eschar are present, are often present on at least part of the wound. Finally, unstageable. Skin loss is full thickness and the base is completely covered with slough or eschar, obscuring the true depth of the wound. Pressure occurs as a result of gravity. Excessive or prolonged pressure can compress blood vessels at the point of contact, leading to ischemia, inflammation, and tissue necrosis. Pressure occurs when the patient is positioned on a hard surface that does not diffuse the weight or when he or she remains in the same position for too long. Friction occurs when surfaces rub the skin and irritate or directly pull off epithelial tissue. Such forces are generated when the patient is dragged or pulled across the bed linen. Shear or shearing forces are generated when the skin itself is stationary and the tissue below the skin, such as fat or muscle, shift or move. The movement of deeper tissue layers reduces the blood supply to the skin, leading to skin hypoxia, anoxia, ischemia, inflammation, and necrosis. Pressure ulcer prevention. Pad contact surfaces with foam, silicon gel, air pads, or other pressure relieving pads. Do not keep the head of the bed elevated above 30 degrees to prevent shearing. Use a lift sheet to move a patient in the bed. Avoid dragging or sliding him or her. When positioning a patient on his side or her side, do not position directly on the trochanter. Reposition an immobile patient at least every two hours while in bed and at least every one hour while sitting in a chair. Do not place a rubber ring or donut under the patient's sacral area. When moving an immobile, immobile patient from one bed to another surface, use a designated slide board with well lubricator to talc 
and use a mechanical lift. Place pillows or foam wedges between two bony surfaces. Keep the patient's skin directly off of plastic surfaces. Keep the patient's heels off the bed surface using bed pillows under the ankles. Ensure that fluid intake is between 2 and 3 liters per day and help the patient to maintain an adequate intake of protein and calories. Perform a daily inspection of the patient's entire skin. Document and report any manifestations of skin infection. Use moisturizers daily on dry skin and apply when skin is damp. Keep moisture from prolonged contact with the skin. Dry areas where two skin surfaces touch, such as the axilla and under the breasts. <clears throat> Place absorbent pads under areas where perspiration collects. Use moisture barriers, or barriers on skin areas where wound drainage or incontinence occurs. Do not massage bony prominences. Humidify the room. Clean the skin as soon as possible after soiling occurs and at routine intervals. Use tepid rather than hot water. In the perineal area, use a disposable cleaning cloth that contains a skin barrier agent. While cleaning, use minimum scrubbing force necessary to remove soil. Gently pat rather than rub the skin dry. Do not use powders or talcs directly on the perineum. After cleansing, apply a commercial skin barrier to those areas in frequent contact with urine or feces. <clears throat> the following factors can be measured through the Braden scale. Perception. Cha perception changes and decreased sensory perception determine whether the patient is a partner in the prevention of pressure ulcers. When the patient understands that turning and shifting of weight prevent tissue damage, the risk for pressure ulcers decreases. When he or she has a mental status problem because of stroke, head injury, organic brain disease, Alzheimer's, or other problems with cognition, the risk for pressure ulcer formation increases. Moisture generally occurs with incontinence and results in prolonged contact of the skin with such substances as urea, bacteria, yeast, and enzymes carried in urine, urine and feces. These substances are irritants and lead to skin breakdown. Excessive moisture macerates intact skin, increasing the risk for breakdown. The skin should be washed with a pH balanced soap to maintain the normal acid level. Creams or lotions are used to lubricate and moisturize the skin. Barrier ointment protection is needed whenever incontinence is present. Reddened areas are never massaged directly because this action can damage capillary beds and increase tissue necrosis. <laughs> Activity and mobility is a direct factor in the risk for pressure ulcer formation. Patients who have unimpaired mobility and can respond to physical sensation changes are at low risk for pressure ulcer formation. Any patient, regardless of age, who requires assistance with turning and positioning or who is less aware of physical sensation changes is at high risk for pressure ulcer formation. Anyone who is confined to bed or to a chair is at higher risk than a patient who requires assistance with ambulation. Nutritional status assessment includes laboratory studies such as pre-albumin and albumin levels, evaluation of weight and weight change, ability of the patient to consume an adequate diet, and the need for vitamin, mineral, or protein supplementation. Indicators of inadequate nutrition include unintentional weight loss of 10% or more of total body weight in less than six months' time. Friction, shear, Friction and shear measure the likelihood that a patient's skill, skin will rub against bony prominences or whenever the patient's skin might be rubbed against a firm, firm surface when being moved by the nurses. Positioning is critical in reducing pressure. A good plan for positioning is the 30 degree rule. This plan ensures that the patient is positioned and propped so that whatever part of the body is elevated is tilted back at least 30 degrees to the mattress 
rather than resting directly on dependent bony prominence. This rule applies to side-lying as well as head-of-the-bed elevation positions. The patient who requires greater elevation because of respiratory difficulties should be tilted forward even more than 90 degrees with pillows behind the back to keep pressure off the sacral coccyx area. Types of wound exudates, serosanguinous exudates. This is blood-tinged amber fluid consisting of serum and red blood cells. This is normal for the first 48 hours after injury. A sudden increase in the amount, of pr amount precedes wound dehiscence and wounds closed by first intention. Purulent exudate, creamy yellow pus, often staphylococcus. Greenish blue pus causing standing or dressings and accompanied by a fruity odor, pseudomonas. Beige pus with a fishy odor, proteus. Brownish pus, brownish pus with a fecal odor is aerobic coliform in bacteroides. Usually occurs after intestinal surgery. Laboratory assessment. A wound that is exposed is always contaminated, but not always infected. Contamination is the presence of organisms without any manifestations of infection. Wound infection is contamination with pathogenic organisms to the degree that the growth and spread cannot be controlled by the body's immune defenses. Wounds that are infected have odor and have a moderate to heavy exudate or drainage and should be cultured to identify the causative organism and determine its sensitivity to antibiotics. If wounds are extensive, the patient or if the patient is severely Im immune compromised or local blood supply to the wound is impaired, bacterial growth may exceed the body's ability to defend itself against invasion into the deeper tissue layers. The result is a deep wound infection and eventually bacteremia and sepsis, such as a systemic, a, a systemic infection. A properly designed dressing can speed healing by removing unwanted debris from the ulcer surface. Protecting exposed healthy tissue and creating a barrier between the body and the environment until the ulcer is closed. For a patient with a draining necrotic ulcer, the dressing must also remove excessive exudate and loose debris without damaging epithelial cells or newly formed granulation tissue. If necrosis is extensive and the eschar is thick, Dead tissue must be surgically or chemically removed before further debridement with dressings can be effective. Depending on the dressing material used, dressings help remove debris either through mechanical debridement or by natural chemical debridement, that is creating an environment that promotes self-digestion of dead tissues by bacterial enzymes. After all the tissue has been removed, protection of any exposed tendons, bones, and newly formed collagen is critical to the pressure ulcer care. The ideal environment for healing is a clean, slightly moist ulcer surface with minimal bacterial colonization. Heavy moisture from an excessively draining ulcer or a dressing that is too wet interferes with healing by promoting the growth of organisms and causing maceration or mushiness of healthy tissue. Likewise, if a clean ulcer surface is exposed to air or if highly absorbent dressings or materials are used for prolonged periods, the drying effects can dehydrate the surface cells, form scabs, or convert the wound into a deeper injury. The frequency of dressing changes depends on the amount of necrotic material or exudate. Dry gauze dressings are changed when the strike through occurs or when the outer layer of the dressing first becomes saturated with exudate. Gauze dressings used for debridement, such as those placed on a wound wet and allowed to become damp and then removed, are changed often enough to take any loose debris or exudate, usually every four to six hours. Synthetic dressings are changed when exudate causes the adhesive seal to break and leakage to occur. Before applying any dressing, gently clean the ulcer surface with saline or a non-toxic wound cleanser as prescribed. 
Vacuum assisted wound closure, or VAC, has been used successfully to reduce or even close chronic ulcers by removing fluids or infectious materials from the wound and enhancing the formulation, formation of granulation tissue. This technique requires that a suction tube be covered by a special sponge and sealed in place for 48 hours. During that time, continuous low-level negative pressure is applied through the suction tube. Duration of the treatment is determined by the wound's response. It should not be used in areas where skin cancer is located and failure of the VAC therapy is often due to the inability to maintain an adequate and consistent dressing seal. Surgical debridement is the removal of thick adherent wound crust using a scalpel or scissors. It may be performed to hasten the removal of dead tissue, a potential source of infection. The longer the open wound exists, the greater the risk for sepsis or prolonged hospitalization. Depending on the size and depth of the ulcer and projected blood loss, debridement can be performed at the bedside or in a treatment room by a wound care specialist or advanced practice nurse. When the wound is large or has a risk for excessive bleeding, debridement is performed in an operating room. In either case, the patient should receive sedation or local anesthetic before the procedure. Grafting is used for wound closure. When full thickness ulcers cannot close and when natural healing would result in a loss of joint function, an unacceptable cosmetic skin appearance or a high potential for wound reoccurrence. Successful skin grafting requires a clean, granulating, or freshly excised ulcer bed. Partial thickness, split thickness, or full thickness strips of skin are removed from the donor area, transferred to the ulcer, and sutured or stapled into place. Grafts can come from a self or autograft, a cadaver or homograft, or an allograft, or another species, heterograft or xenograft. Post-op care. After grafting surgery, graft sites are immobilized with bulky cotton pressure dressings for three to five days to allow for vascularization or to take of the newly grafted skin. Do not disturb the dressing and encourage elevation and complete rest of the grafted area to allow blood vessels to connect the graft with the wound bed. Any activity that might cause movement of the dressing against the body and separation of the graft from the wound is prohibited. After dressings are removed, monitor the graft for indications of failure to vascularize, non-adherence to the wound, or graft necrosis. A pale flap with delayed capillary filling when blanched may have inadequate arterial perfusion. A dusky color or sharp line of color change suggests inadequate venous or lymphatic drainage. Nursing care of partial thickness donor sites aims to protect the area from injury and infection until re-epithelialization can, can occur and to promote comfort. A pressure dressing is usually placed over the donor area to promote homeostasis. After 24 to 48 hours, this outer dressing is removed, revealing a single wound contact layer of fine mesh gauze or synthetic mesh material. The donor site is initially may be more painful than the graft sites. Administer analgesics as prescribed and provide other comfort measures as needed. Reposition the patient during the immediate period after surgery to promote comfort only if movement of the graft site can be avoided. Infections. Bacterial skin lesions usually start at the hair follicle where bacteria can easily collect and grow in the warm, moist envir environment. Folliculitis is a superficial infection involving only the upper portion of the follicle and is usually caused by Staphylococcus. The rash is raised and red and usually shows a small pustule. Furuncles, or boils, are also caused by Staphylococcus, but the infection is much deeper in the follicle. This larger, sore-looking, raised bump may or may not have a pustule ahead at its point. Cellulitis is a generalized infection with either Staphylococcus or Streptococcus 
and involves the deeper connective tissue. It typically occurs after some kind of skin trauma, and examples would be surgery, scratches, use of contaminated needles, accidental injuries, patients with diabetes, or poor circulation at highest risk. The herpes simplex virus infection is the most common viral infection of adult skin. HSV infections are of two types. Type 1, HSV1, infections cause the classic recurring cold sore. The severity of the disease increases with age and is worse when the patient is immunosuppressed. Genital herpes caused by type 2 infections, HSV2, is also recurrent. After the first infection, the virus remains in the body in a dormant state in the nerve ganglia and the patient has no symptoms. Reactivation stimulates the virus to travel the pathways of sensory nerves to the skin where lesions reappear. In healthy people, recurrence of HSV infection is triggered by physical or psychological stressors such as dry lips, sunburn, trauma, fever, menses, or fatigue. The virus can also be spread by direct contact between an actively infected person and a susceptible host. The time span between episodes and severity of each attack varies. Outbreaks of oral herpes simplex usually last 3 to 10 days. The patient sheds virus and is contagious for the first 3 to 5 days. The patient may have tingling or burning of the lip before any lesion is evident. The most common clinical picture of HSV-1 infection is isolated or group vesicles on a red base. The infection can occur anywhere on the skin and may be spread by respiratory droplets or by direct contact with an active lesion or virus-containing fluid such as saliva. The lesions are painful and unsightly. Herpes zoster is caused by reactivation of the dormant varicella zoster virus in patients who have previously had chickenpox. The dormant virus resides in the dorsal root ganglia of the sensory, cranial, and spinal nerves. The lesions of herpes zoster infections are similar to those of herpes simplex, but they have a different distribution pattern. Multiple lesions occur in a segmental distribution on the skin innervated by the infected nerve. Herpes zoster eruptions usually occur after several days of discomfort, which may, may vary from minor irritation and itching to severe, deep pain. The eruption usually lasts for several weeks. Post-herpetic neuralgia, severe pain persisting after the lesions have resolved, is a common complication in older patients. Herpes zoster is a disease of immunosuppression. Occurring in most often with greater severity in, in people, oops, sorry about that. Herpes zoster is a disease of immunosuppression. Herpes zoster is a disease of immunosuppression, occurring most often with greater severity in older people or in anyone who is immunosuppressed for any reason. The disorder can be accompanied by fever and malaise, often progressing to visceral involvement. It is contagious to people who have not, been previ who have not previously had chickenpox and who have not been vaccinated against the disease. Contagion is most likely when lesions are present and filled with blisters and fluid filled blisters. Keeping patients with these lesions separated from other patients in the environment until the lesions have crusted reduces the risk for transmitting the virus to others. Complications include full thickness skin necrosis, Bell's palsy, or eye infection, and scarring if the virus is introduced into the sky, to, to the eye. For older adults who have had chicken box and are therefore at risk for shingles, herpes zoster, a new vaccine has been approved, Zostavax. 
Its use is recommended for any adult older than 60 years who does not ha currently have shingles. It is given as a one-time subcutaneous injection of 0.65 mL. The drug should not be given as an IM or IV injection and should not be given to anyone who is immunosuppressed. Acyclovir, Zovirax, is used for the treatment of viral infections. Topical treatment decreases the number of active virus on the skin and reduces pain in primary hermetic, her, not hermetic, herpetic infections and localized lesions in immunocompromised patients. Topical treatment is of little benefit in recurring infection. IV administration is limited to severe primary infection in immunosuppressed patients with systems of a systemic infection. Candida albicans, also known as a yeast infection, is another common superficial fungal infection of skin and mucous membranes. The organism is present almost everywhere and easily grows in warm, moist environments. Risk factors for this infection include immunosuppression, long-term antibiotic therapy, diabetes mellitus, and obesity. The incidence is higher in hot, humid climates. Infected skin has a moist, red, irritated appearance and usually causes itching and burning. Common areas for infection include the perineum, vagina, axilla, under the breasts, and in the mouth where it is also known as thrush. The treatment. Prevention is aimed at keeping skin fold areas dry and clean. Turning patients and positioning to enhance airflow also aid in prevention. When the infection is present, meticulous cleanliness and the use of topical antifungal agents are needed. Topical antifungal agents are used for patients with yeast infections. And imidazole cream is applied to the infected skin at least twice a day until the lesions have cleared. To prevent recurrence, therapy is usually considered continued for one to two weeks after clearing. In some instances, antifungal powders may also help suppress fungal growth. For widespread or, widespread or resistant fungal infections, systemic antifungal agents such as ketonazole and, or nizorol are given. Burn injuries are classified according to depth. The burn might go all the way through or part of all the the burn might go through part or all of the dermis. If it goes through part of the dermis, it's called a partial thickness. If it goes through all of the dermis, it's a full thickness. If it goes all the way through the dermis and into the subcutaneous and even into the muscle, it is called a deep full thickness. Partial thickness can be broken down to superficial, which would be just the top one third, to deep, which would be the top two thirds. In superficial, partial thickness burn, one-third of all the epidermis has been burned, and the top one-third of the dermis has been burned. This burn can typically occur through brief contact with a really hot object or lengthy contact with a not-so-hot object. The superficial, partial thickness burn has the following characteristics. It's pink to red in color, mildly swollen, blistery, moist. It will blanch when pressed when pressure is applied, and it will heal in a few weeks. It does have severe pain. In a deep partial thickness burn, the burn goes through at least two-thirds of the dermis. The burn will have the following characteristics. It's red, dry with white areas, no blistering due to burnt blood vessels, moderate swelling, and it will take longer to heal. heal. could be two to six weeks, Again, severe pain. Full thickness burns go all the way through the dermis. The burn takes on the following characteristics. Black, brown, yellow, white, or red colors. Severe swelling. It might have pain around the edges and feelings of pressure, but there's no blistering. And it won't heal without grafting. And healing can take months. In deep full thickness burns, 
All is burnt down to the subcutaneous or even muscle layers. The following characteristics exist. Black in color, no edema, pain, or blisters. The vessels and nerve endings have all been destroyed. The skin is hard and inelastic. Patients must have grafting, and again, healing takes months. Using the rule of nines, we can easily come up with a percentage of body area burned. The entire head is nine, each arm is nine percent, each leg is eighteen percent, the trunk is eighteen percent, and the back is eighteen percent. When more than twenty percent of the body surface is burned, there will be systemic effects. Thermal injuries can occur from dry heat injuries, which tend to be caused by flames, such as in a house fire or explosion. In the elderly, a dry heat burn can be caused by a heating pad that is left in place too long. Moist heat injuries, also called scalding, occur with hot liquid or steam. Scald injuries are the most common in older adults. Contact burns occur when hot metal, tar, grease, come in contact with the skin. A good example? touching your hand to a space heater or a hot iron. Grease and tar can exceed the temperatures of 400 degrees Fahrenheit, causing serious burn injuries quickly. Chemical burns come into contact with the skin when the chemicals are or when the chemicals are ingested. Alkalis, such as found in oven cleaner, fertilizer, drain cleaner, damage skin by causing denaturing of the protein or breakdown. Once the tissue begins to break down, the chemical can travel further into the skin. Acids, such as bathroom cleaners, rust remover, and the chemical for swimming pools damage tissue by coagulating cells. So less damage is actually caused than would be caused by alkaline products. Organic compounds, such as gasoline, dissolve fat and can be quickly toxic to the liver and kidneys. Electricity injuries occur when the current enters the body. Electrical injuries are often not visible from the outside, but awful things are going on inside. High voltage injury happens with exposure to over 1000 volts. The epidermis is most resistant to electricity. Once the skin resistance is overcome, the internal organs are highly conductive and pass current all around. Skin and bone is resistant. The bones heat up and then burn surrounding muscle, including the heart. The longer the electricity is in contact with the body, the greater the damage. Electrical burns can occur from electrical sparks from a source or from direct contact. Organs that are not in the path of the current immediately become necrotic. Electrical injuries are low as far as incidence, but tend to hit the younger adult. Patients who have sustained electrical injury are likely to have cardiac dysrhythmias afterwards. Finally, radiation burns occur as a result of treatment for cancer. Usually burns from radiation for cancer or treatment are mild. Radiation injury is more serious in industrial settings. Other causes, sunburn or use of tanning booths. Each system is severely affected by burns that extend over 20% of the body and are more than superficial. The cardiovascular system is affected primarily through fluid shifts. In the initial phase of the burn, also caused the emergent, the body goes into total in inflammatory reaction. Fluid within the vessels leaks out into the space between the cells, the interstitial, interstitial space. This condition is also called third spacing or capillary leak. With too much depletion of fluid in the vascular space, the patient goes into shock or could go into shock. Shock is evidenced by increased heart rate and low blood pressure, decreased urine output and confusion. And by shock, we mean little to no cardiac, cardiac output. At this point, the patient is in dire need of intravenous fluid replacement. This phase lasts for about 48 hours and then comes to the acute phase. During the acute phase, the fluid starts to travel back into the vessels. When combined with the IV fluid that the patient received during the emergent phase, the patient now has too much IV fluid for the heart to pump and now heart failure can occur. 
dysrhythmias are likely if the patient has had an electrical burn or if the patient had a cardiac problem already and now the heart is forced to work harder to work with fluid deficits or fluid excess. Where does fluid and electrolyte travel during such serious injuries? During the emergent phase, fluid leaks from the intravascular space into the interstitial space. In the acute phase, the fluid travels or remobilizes back into the vessels. The patient will have a low sodium level. They'll be hyponatremic during the emergent and acute phases. During the emergent phase, sodium leaks out into the interstitial space. In the acute phase, as all the fluid remobilizes back into the bloodstream, the sodium is diluted. Potassium levels are high in the emergent phase. In the emergent phase, cells are burnt, necrotic, and otherwise damaged. This damage causes cells to burst and release potassium into the bloodstream. So the potassium level is high. In the acute phase, potassium level is low as the fluid shifts or remobilizes back into the bloodstream. The arterial pH during rate in relation to burn injury is low or acidotic. This is because there is typically respiratory compromise and renal damage as the kidneys are forced to deal with excess myoglobin from damaged muscle cells. Red and white cells and platelets will be elevated during the emergent phase as fluid shifts out of the vessels, leaving a relative excess of cells. In the acute phase, with fluid shifting back into the intravascular space, cells are diluted and there is a relatively low blood count. Pulmonary problems often contribute to the cause of death. The most problems are swelling around the airway. Constriction of face or chest from tight skin or carbon monoxide poisoning. You should suspect respiratory problems if the patient has burns on the face, singed nasal hair, or a change in voice quality. Airway edema is common with interstitial fluid collection, that is pulmonary edema. The patient might have restricted chest movement when skin becomes tight and leathery. The trachea itself might swell from irritants. Carbon monoxide molecules will mimic oxygen and attach to the hemoglobin to be transported around the circulatory system. The vasodilating effect of carbon dioxide causes the patient to have cherry red appearance. Excuse me, carbon, the, cherry, the vasodilating effect of carbon monoxide causes the patient to have a cherry red appearance. In se severe carbon monoxide poisoning, the patient will develop neuroscience such as vertigo, stupor, and headache and nausea. Inhalation injury occurs with 20 to 50 percent of patients admitted to burn centers. Watch for patients who have been in closed spaces, are burned on the face, and have a charcoal look on teeth and gums. Patients who are unconscious at the time of injury, clients with singed hair, hoarseness, or use of accessory muscles and wheezing. The digestive tract itself is not generally injured, but changes occur due to the decreased blood flow to the stomach and intestines. Because of the decreased blood flow and sympathetic response during the emergent phase, there is a slowing of peristalsis. A paralytic ileus is typical. The patient will typically have no bowel sounds or flatus and have an abdominal distension and nausea. Patients with burns over more than 25% of the body cannot even digest their own secretions and end up on, with an NG tube on suction. The patients are also very much at risk for developing an ulcer. This ulcer is called a curling's ulcer. You must keep an eye out for ulcer development by checking for occult blood. H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors are essential. Curling's ulcer is an acute peptic ulcer of the duodenum resulting from complications from severe burns when a reduced plasma volume leads to sloughing of the gastric mucosa. These stress ulcers were once a common complication of serious burns, presenting in over 10% of cases, and especially common in child burn victims. They result in perforation and hemorrhage more often than other forms of intestinal 
<clears throat> intestinal ulceration and had correspondingly high mortality rates. While emergency surgery was once the only treatment, the combination therapies include enteral feeding with powerful antacids such as H2 receptor antagonists or, more recently, proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, which have made Curling's ulcer a rare complication. A similar condition involving elevated intracranial pressure is known as a Cushing's ulcer. The burn-injured patient has a metabolic rate that is two to three times greater than that of nor normal person. What a way to lose weight. A hypermetabolic state occurs from the massive physical stress response leading to an outpouring of catecholamines. Large amounts of glucose and protein are needed to keep the body's temperature. There is an increased oxygen and caloric requirement for tissue repair and healing. Nutritional requirements can easily exceed 5,000 kcals per day. The patient might not be able to eat for a while due to paralytic ileus or oral, oral injuries. A nasoduodenal tomb may be used or total parenteral nutrition might be necessary as a last resort, but its use can cause further, further problems with infection. Because the skin is no longer intact and it's the skin that keeps it inside the body, the patient is, develop, is prone to developing hypothermia. A warm environment is needed when working with wounds, and you must be quick. Infection is a major complication of burns. Infection is linked to impaired resistance from disruption of the skin's mechanical integrity and gen generalized immune suppression. The skin barrier is replaced by eschar. This moist, protein-rich, avascular environment encourages microbial growth. Migration of immune cells is hampered, and there is a release of intermediaries that impede the immune response. Escar also restricts the distribution of systemically administered antibiotics because of its avascularity. Escar is a burned crust that forms from clotted particles. It's dead tissue that gets in the way of healing. Escar can be very dangerous when around the neck or chest, impairing expansion and breathing. In the early stages of wound healing, the escar is dry, leathery, and firmly attached to the wound surface. As the inflammatory phase of wound healing begins and the removal of wound debris progresses, the escar starts to lift and separate from the tissue beneath. This non-living eschar is a good breeding ground for bacteria normally found on the skin surface, as well as those introduced by other means. As bacteria increase, they release enzymes that soften the necrotic tissue. This tissue becomes softer and more yellow. In the presence of bacterial colonization, wound exudate increases substantially and the color and odor of the wound exudate indicate the major organism present. It might be necessary to cut away the escar in a procedure called an escarotomy. Risk factors of burn and wound infection include burns greater than 30% um, TBS to full thickness burn, extremities in age, and pre-existing disease, virulence, and antibiotic resistance of colonizing organism, organisms, failed skin drafts, improper in initial burn wound care, prolonged open burn wounds. Burn wounds are prone to tetanus, so a tetanus booster shot is required if an individual has not been immunized, immunized in the last five years. The immune system is quickly overwhelmed Gram-negative infections are particularly dangerous and can lead to sepsis. Gram-positive infections are more common and slower to cause trouble. Bacteria such as Staphylococcus, Proteus, Pseudomonas, E. coli, and Klebsiella are, find optimal conditions for growth within the burned wound. Fungi such as Candida albicans also grow easily. The kidney can shut down quickly with burn injuries. The kidneys are forced to filter burnt cells, or solute B, 
and processed myoglobin, a byproduct of dead muscle cells. This leads to nephron malfunction, otherwise known as intrarenal failure. During the emergent phase, there can be extreme loss of blood flow due to the, uh, to the kidneys due to the capillary leaks. So in addition to the kidneys having to filter out a bunch of junk, there's also less fluid to dilute and help push the junk through the glomerulus. It is extremely vital to ensure that the patient has an hourly output of at least 30 mLs per hour and preferably 50 mLs per hour. That means the patient needs a catheter with a urometer and lots of IV fluid. Contractures can occur because of burnt skin that turns into eschar and scar tissue. When the tissue is tight, the patient is unable to extend extremities and muscles tighten into a flexed position. Another big problem is with compartment syndrome. Compart compartment syndrome is an acute medical problem in which increased pressure, usually caused by inflammation, within a confined space, the fascial compartment, in the body impairs blood supply. Without prompt treatment, it may lead to nerve damage and muscle death. This condition is most commonly seen in the anterior compartment and posterior compartment of the leg. In compartment syndrome, you know the patient has a compartment syndrome when they have negative CSM. No circulation, no sensation, no movement. That is, when you can't detect those items, you know that there is, this is when there is a weak or absent pulse, the extremity is cold, and the patient complains of numbness. Acute compartment syndrome is a medical emergency requiring immediate surgical treatment known as a fasciotomy to allow the pressure to return to normal. All burn injuries are painful. With partial thickness burns, nerve endings are exposed, increasing sensitivity and pain. With full thickness burns, nerve endings are completely destroyed. At first, these wounds may not transmit sensation except at wound edges when a sharp stimulus is applied. Despite this destruction, patients often have dull or pressure-type pain in these areas. Procedures involving the treating of burns only escalate the pain. The patient requires intravenous opioids and may no use nitrous oxide during procedures. Anti-anxiety meds help as well. Long-acting oral meds might help if, digestive, if the digestive tract is functioning. Titration of opioids such as morphine, hydromorphine, and fentanyl are best. Drug therapy usually requires both opioid analgesics such as morphine sulfate, hydromorphone, dilated, fentanyl, and non-opioid analgesics. Although these drugs may provide adequate pain relief when no procedures are being performed, they rarely offer more than moderate relief during acutely painful procedures. In addition, they depress respiratory function and reduce intestinal mobility. The IV route is used for giving opioid drugs because of the problem with absorption from the muscle and stomach. When these agents are given IM or subcutaneously, they remain in the tissue spaces and do not relieve pain. In addition, when edema is present, all the doses are rapidly absorbed at once and fluid shift is resolving. This delayed absorption can result in lethal blood levels of analgesics. Initially, the vessels will construct to save every bit of fluid this is followed by the leaky compartment syndrome. With third spacing, priorities of care for burn patients are support the airway, deliver oxygen, give drugs to decrease swelling, intubate for a PO2 less than 60 millimeters of mercury, support circulation with large amounts of IV fluids, treat pain with intravenous opioids, treat burn wounds to protect from infection and maintain temperature, support temperature and place the patient in a healing blanket in a heating blanket and warm IV fluids and of course provide emotional support. Fluid replacement is the second critical step after making sure the patient can breathe. Use the Parkland Baxter formula. To use this formula, take the patient's body surface area, 
that's been burned times the weight in kilograms times 4. Multiply this out, then give half this amount in the first 8 hours and the second half in the next 16. For example, 50 kilogram patient with a 50% body surface area burned, that's 50 times 50 times 4, which is 10,000. So give 5,000 mLs in 8 hours, so that's 625 mLs per hour, and then cut the rate in half for the next 16. That, After that, titrate to keep urine output at least 30 mLs per hour. And of course, you'll be using an isotonic fluid, more than likely lactated ringers. Thank you.